Now, those of you who listen to this show on a regular basis will know that I am certainly no enthusiast uh, for eco-plankery, uh, neither am I an enthusiast for carbon neutrality, neither am I in any way uh, a supporter of Extinction Rebellion, and I'm very happy to say that the man I'm about to speak to, Dr Benny Pizer, is of a similar disposition. Dr Benny, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now, it doesn't come as any great surprise that we've been issued with a let, a, a yet another dictum uh, from the eco-maniacs saying that, you know, it may not be possible for us to be uh, climate neutral or carbon neutral uh, by 2050. Um, and I would certainly go along with that. Yeah, I mean, this new report uh, is basically trying to debunk the claims by, by Labour and by Extinction Rebellion and uh, climate activists that it would be possible to completely decarbonize be uh, before 2050. Mm. And as you said, the, the implication would be uh, no more meat eating, uh, no more flying, uh, hardly any driving. But what is more interesting in the report is that they're saying yeah, by 2050, we will have to do it anyhow. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, we'll have to cut eating meat by half. We have to cut flying by half. So no more cheap holidays abroad. No more uh, um, really cheap meat. No, no cheap driving. No cheap heating. Everything will be expensive. I mean, this report just shows you how crazy, how unbelievably utopian this whole net zero madness is. Yeah, and it is madness. You're quite right to call it that because, quite frankly, nobody is even absolutely certain that if we were to achieve carbon neutrality that it would, in fact, make any difference anyway. Well, that's the point. I mean, one of the reasons why Britain has managed to reduce its CO2 emissions quite substantially over the last 20 years or so is simple. We've just moved all the kind of heavy industry abroad mm. and we're importing all the products from China, uh, Vietnam and India, from other Asian countries and say, well, look, we, we are green, we don't emit CO2, but we are simply importing the stuff from countries that do emit yes. CO2. So no matter, even if Britain were to go completely zero on carbon emissions, it will be totally overwhelmed by CO2 emissions in the rest of the world. So it's completely futile unless there is a global agreement that everyone does the same, and we know that's not going to happen. No, of course. And, of course, we didn't export all of those uh, heavy industries because of climate change. We exported them because they know how to do that stuff cheaper than we do, and therefore it wasn't economical for us to do that anymore. That's right. That's right. Well, it's a combination... It's cheaper to produce these things in countries that have uh, lower standards, lower wages, and we obviously benefit from cheaper products. So we can go to shops and buy very cheap clothing and, and shoes, and, and everything is much cheaper because it's produced in low-labor countries. Yeah. But we shouldn't assume or claim that as a result we are such a green a low emitting country mm. because we are still using the same products that are produced with CO2 emissions. We're just just not producing them in the UK. Right. Well, like, also, Extinction Rebellion's kind of claims have been sort of rather thrust uh, into the limelight recently because they're, they're, their mask has been starting to slip because they're no longer just asking for, you know, a climate revolution. They're asking now for a complete political revolution uh, and a capitalism revolution yeah. uh, and a move away from uh, the way that the world works into a sort of almost agrarian, um, you know, backward-looking... It's, you know, sort of return to the caveman times. Well, that parts of them uh, are, are advocating them. Par you know, parts of the climate campaigners have always been anti-capitalist and always used the, the, the climate issue mm. to, to, to uh, bash our free market economies. Um, but the, 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 the point is that the more they uh, advocate these kind of um, policies, the less popular the issue becomes. And so you will see, you already see a growing concern about the rising costs of these policies. And once people realize uh, that they will suffer and they will be hurt and they will have to sacrifice so much uh, on the altar of the, of the green religion, there will be a public backlash big time. And the government uh, is 
at risk of underestimating the mood in the country. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And I think you told me the last time we spoke that, you know, we've gone as far as we can go as a government and as a country uh, without causing people too much pain in terms of, you know, the green um, sort of policies that, that we've been introducing. Now comes the time when it's difficult for the government because right. they're going to have to start causing pain, uh, whether it be in a taxation form or in, in change behaviour. That's right, and, and that's why um, the, the net zero policy adopted uh, or rushed through Parliament without real scrutiny and with misleading information mm. about its cost has an economic risk and a political risk. The economic risk is that uh, as, as you make energy more expensive, everything becomes more expensive. Um, think about house building. Um, to make houses net zero re requires so much additional technology, so much additional work, so yeah. much additional heating costs that, of course, house building will slow down. People won't be able to afford more expensive houses, never mind more expensive heating. So there is an economic uh, price, but there's also a political price because the government would very quickly become unpopular if people felt that pain in their pockets. And, well, so they're, and particularly they're, if, they're, if they're made to, say, for example, rip out their gas cent central heating boiler uh, and replace it with an electric one, uh, which, which, which they will have to somehow come, come up with the money for, if they're told they have to have an electric car rather than a diesel car, you know, which they have to pay for, people are going to revolt, aren't they? Absolutely. That's, that's the political risk of these policies that haven't been fully thought through, haven't really been costed. Mm. Government has never, ever really uh, fully costed uh, these policies. And whenever they are asked, they, they, they are not providing any information or costing. So it's a political risk, and it's very unlikely to happen. Now, there is a good chance that this goes belly up anyhow at the COP, at the UN Climate Conference in November, right. when the UK public will realise that the, you know, some of the big players, some of the big emitters, never, you know, particularly <clears throat> China, India and the US, uh, have no interest whatsoever in these net zero policies. And eventually they will realise that this is just virtue signaling without anyone following suit. Well, exactly right. Which which begs the question, I suppose, is Greta Thunberg right when she says that, uh, you know, nobody's doing anything? Because I always say, well, you can't just keep coming to this country and telling us we're not doing anything because this government has pledged to do all sorts of things. Well, she obviously comes uh, from a different point of view. She yeah. thinks we have to decarbonise basically within 10, 15 years or right. 20 years, uh, like Extinction Rebellion. So in, in their eyes, governments are not doing enough. Even the British government uh, or any European government isn't doing enough. Um, but the reality is that even though European countries are decarbonizing mm. and Britain has been decarbonizing, it's completely irrelevant. Who cares what Europe is doing? Who cares what Britain is doing? Who cares what the U.S. is doing? Because the rising powers... And the rising population, the rising industry is in Asia. Right. And that's overwhelming any cuts in emissions completely. Yeah. That's why CO2 emissions, despite us decarbonizing, the CO2 emissions keep rising because the developing world is developing. And well, rightly so. And becoming wealthier and becoming exactly. more able to afford uh, the things, the very things that pollute the planet. Well, CO2 isn't a pollutant. So CO2 is not polluting the planet. It is a greenhouse gas. It, it obviously uh, adds to the global warming. But no, but what I'm saying is, is that if, for example, more people in India have the money to buy air conditioning units, that's going to pollute the atmosphere. If more people in China can afford to buy cars, that's going to pollute the atmosphere. Well, it, it, uh, well I, I wouldn't use the word pollute because CO2 isn't a pollutant in the, what we normally think of, you know, air pollution. Uh, it, it, it certainly, you're right, it increases quite significantly CO2 emissions, yeah. greenhouse gas emissions, because now people move from, you know, from cycling through China to cars, and um, many 
uh, hundreds of millions of Chinese and Indians are now middle class and have living standards like uh, you know, many yeah. people in the West. Well, that's and what I mean. If you if you move from nine million bicycles to nine million cars, you know that's going to make a bit of a, a bit of a mess, isn't it? Um, well, on the streets, yeah, it will be crowded. But the cars nowadays are fairly clean, fairly compared to ten, twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, so you have air pollution in China and India, but that is primarily air pollution from power plants, and uh, they are building still you know, coal-fired power plants all over Asia. So whatever we shut down, they build twice, three times yeah. every week, every month. So that's what I'm saying. If the world wants to solve the issue of uh, CO2 emissions, it has to be a global attempt. But if only Britain or Europe does it, it's completely futile. And that's the situation currently. And it's futile in two ways. A, because um, CO2 emissions are still going up, and B, because a lot of industry will simply not stay in Europe if Europe becomes uncompetitive, yes. if we make our e economy more expensive um, for, for companies to invest in, in Europe, they will just move to countries where they can work cheaper. Yes, absolutely right. Dr. Benny Pizer, thank you very much indeed, Director of the Global Warming Policy Forum. Another voice of common sense on the climate issue uh, that faces us all at the moment because it is quite simply ludicrous, is it not, for this government to continue down this eco path uh, of greenness, of making everybody cycle around uh, on bicycles, of making everybody pay even more money to heat their homes, for people to buy electric cars because uh, the other, any other form of car is simply going to be out it is totally and utterly ridiculous, and I really do hope that we somehow get to a point at which we stop all of this nonsense, we stop all of this craziness, and we stop trying to become climate neutral or carbon neutral by any time whatsoever.